Thank you for joining us for the Guest in Gusto Symposium, Pass the Mic, Latinx Design Creatives. I'm Bernardo Coronado Guerra, SCAT staff and interior design alum. And today we're talking with Latinx creative leaders making a global impact on the design world. We're also joined now by Interior Design Magazine Editor-in-Chief Cindy Allen, who is a true champion of the industry, elevating the work of both the giants of design and its rising stars. Cindy, welcome. Thank you, Bernardo. Hola, uh, is everyone is everyone back on? Um, <laughs> Hello, my friend. my friend. I hope you I hope you didn't miss the last um, hour. It was amazing, and right now we've got um, a nice trio of emerging um, rising stars that I'm very very excited to share with you. Uh, a couple things. Remember, I, we want to go into the chat and ask some questions because we want to hear from you, and you're going to be able to relate in a completely different way to this group. Um, as they're making their way and making their mark in the design world. Uh, I, I want to introduce you and then we'll get started. We have, we're going to start with Clarice Semarene, founder of Studio Clarice. Is, is it, how do I say that? Do I say Clarice? Clarice Semarene. Semarene. Um, from um, Brazil. And then there's Marisol Centeno. She's the founder of Marisol Centeno, a studio in Mexico. Um, hola, Marisol. Buenas, ¿qué tal, Cindy? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Buenos días. And Buenos then we have um, then we have partners, which is also a very interesting topic um, for all of you. And they they met outside of school, or they met in school and then they worked. Well, they'll tell us. They'll tell us. And it's Greg Melitonov and Inez Guzman, founder of Tayer Ken. And um, hi, Greg. Uh, and then uh, I guess her Wi-Fi a little bit better. And they have studios in both Guatemala and Costa Rica and New York. So um, we have an amazing group and I can't wait to share them with you. Remember everybody, this is a gift for you today and I want you to listen in and um, be inspired. We know this are tough times and we really wanna share this talent with you. Okay, so for everybody, I'll see you guys in a little bit and let's keep um, Clarice, uh, please stay on. Yeah, you can get the slides going when you can. Um, you know what was really interesting? First of all, you guys, um, if you stayed from the beginning, you met my art director, Carla Lima. So Carla is Brazilian yeah. and Clarice is a friend of Carla's and that's how we connected. Um, Clarice, yeah. I'm sure the students are gonna be very, very interested in how you got started and also the fact that you're working, you're in New York, but you also do projects in Brazil and that kind of connection to your roots. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, the invitation. Thank oh. you, Cindy, thank you, SCAD, and thank you everybody that uh, who is listening to us. Uh, so uh, it all started in Brasilia. It's my, uh, I was born and raised in Brasilia and it's an iconic modernist city in Brazil. So to grow up in this amazing environment uh, helped me define the designer uh, that I'm today. And so from a young age- hey, Clarice, did you, you said it was like kind of like a modernist playground when you were a kid growing up, right? Totally, yeah. Uh, it's kind of a surreal place because it's different from any other city in the world. And uh, to be in this environment, to to grow up in this environment, um, I, I I had a strong um, curiosity about the the archi architecture and the universe behind those windows. And I I wanted always to to visit my friends, but uh, mostly because I wanted to to see the, their apartment, their home, how it was inside. So I always developed this uh, curiosity. And also, uh, since I was a kid, I already draw um, floor plans and sections. So it was very natural. I was already an architect. Yeah. And, and I didn't know. Yeah, Clarice, and, let me ask you, let me ask you, Clarice, having Oscar Niemeyer, you know, did you, you know, let's talk about Brasilia and Oscar Niemeyer. And, you know, he was, it was your outside your backyard in a way. So did you know how famous that was and how famous, what kind of influence, global influence he had on the world of architecture? 
actually only when I, I was uh, older, I yeah. I realized uh, what my city is. But when you uh, you you are born in, a, in an environment like this, you you don't realize that you you only think that it's your universe, right? It's, I mean, when I saw when I met a, a regular city, <laughs> I thought right. it was super weird because yeah. Brasilia, it was normal for me. <laughs> yeah. And what about, yeah. and what about being a woman architect? What was that like? I mean, to be a, a woman architect uh, doesn't matter where where you are. You have to work harder and. Uh, to be here uh, in the U.S., I'm not only uh, a woman, but also Latina, so I have to work even harder. But uh, at the same time, it was easy for me to to uh, keep working uh, remotely uh, when I moved to New York. Uh, it started when I finished my, my... My studio started when I finished my master's in Italy. I moved back to Brazil. And I started my studio, and so um, it's been. Uh, it was in 2011, so it's been nine years developing residential and uh, commercial projects. And then five years ago, I moved to New York, and the initial plan was to stay here for just two years, so my husband could finish his masters. And so at the beginning, I was very worried about keeping, uh, uh, I was worried about losing my clients in Brazil because of the distance. But then I realized that it was a plus to live here uh, because I have access to so many inspiration and art and design. And actually it's a plus uh, to the clients so that I have this, this access. So, and, so, Clarice, so Clarice, so you, Mm -hmm. so at some point you realized, oh, this is an advantage, right? Because there, there are students who are thinking, how did she make that? How did she make that happen? So were you first, you were continuing to work on the projects in Brazil and then starting to get to know people in New York? Yeah, actually, I realized that I've been uh, working remotely since the beginning of my studio, because even when I was in Brazil, I, I was... Uh, I was working from from home, so I love to work from home, and to have this flexibility to have projects in other cities in Brazil and have my team in in different cities. So actually, I, I was already doing it. So I just kept doing it here, and uh, it was uh, easy and natural to to just keep in doing it. But of course, uh, there are some tools and methodologies that you have to strategies that you have to develop to uh, enable you to do it in the best way right because it's not it's not so uh simple and one of the, of the things that i think it's easy for us is just because we are a small studio we are a small studio and and it's uh we we have a very artisanal approach and very human centric approach so it's easy for us to we have one client at a time so it's easy to work very closely with the client in collaboration with the client and uh so it doesn't matter where the client is i i'm gonna use tools to help me extract this essence and see through the client's eyes so Many times I, I don't even um, visit the, the location. I don't, I, I never met the client in person. But uh, what I do is instead of doing just one briefing meeting, I do five brief, briefing meetings. And I, I do, for example, exercises and uh, um, surveys so I can understand deeply this client and and then I'll, i'm able to translate it into space so i think it's very important to to have a, a human-centric approach yeah so just so students out there this this makes a lot of sense and you you just heard hector who has a lot of clients but it you know you start one at a time you start one at a time mm -hmm. and as clarice is saying she's she's made it happen when you think about the pandemic she's been doing it remotely all these years she was completely <laughs> set up for that which is fantastic clarice right 
Yeah. yeah, you're such a great you're such a great example. I want everyone to know this is where is this is your home studio. Where is this one? This this one is in Brasilia. is a studio. Uh, is a graphic design studio, and they uh, they used to work from home, and so they wanted uh, a studio that uh, you have these do domestic vibes. Yeah. So I use a lot of domestic elements and and a lot a lot of solutions to optimize the the small space. And yeah, it was uh, and I used the colors of the the their studio. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So I wanted so I want to tell everybody. So like Carla, my art director, and she's. Um, you know, we're always looking for talent. And she said, you know, there's somebody that I know who's very talented. You know, we always look for great talent, but we don't look for friends of friends. We just look for great work. That's just the way it is, right? Mm -hmm. So, and so she kind of, you know, was shy about, you know, but she knows what I'm going to, you know, she knows what I'm going to like. And she showed me this project, which then, um, which then we published, and it it is that like very light hand that you have, and the way you separate spaces that is um, very interesting. But this was just published, you guys. So here's this again. You saw it in the first project, and now you see it again. This kind of screening that you do. Yeah, I I mean you you mentioned Carla, and actually when uh, I moved here to New York. Um, as I said, we were planning to stay just for two years. So I was just worried about keeping my clients in Brazil. But then I started to connect with this community, this yeah. Brazilian community, and things started to happen. Uh, I mean, people started, even people I didn't know before started to help helping me. And Carla is one of them. <laughs> That's why I have this connection with you. Yes. And also my, my first project in, in New York was also because of this connection in this community. So I think it, it, it's super, it, it's funny because in Brazil, we don't, uh, we don't remember that we are uh, Latin Americans because we, we feel a little bit isolated from the other Spanish speaking countries because we speak Portuguese. So, uh, but when I moved to New York, I, I realized that yes, I am a Latina and, and it was great to, to see how the community uh, help each other, the people help each other and, and this, everything uh, started to happen in, like, naturally. And uh, that's, that's great advice. That's that's great. Um, it, it, it's a great observation, and also really good advice for others too. Mm -hmm. That that you really felt embraced. That you found a community, and you're not just isolated. To I mean, there's definitely a Brazilian community. I have really good friends at, at this amazing Filipino community. But but um, it's not just that. You you find the support in one another, right? Right, and and the Latina Latinx community is not like uh, monolithic. It's it's very diverse. Right, but we find some some things in common and help each other. So it's it's really uh, great. I, I feel I I immediately felt home when I moved to New York. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Now there is an important project that. Um, I want you to share with everybody the hospitality project. So tell mm -hmm. them how that how that happened. Yeah, that that happened also because of I mean uh, they they feel they felt that I was the right fit for the project, but there was a friend of a friend who rec recommended me. So um, it is uh, uh, an existing building in Chelsea. It, the, this building is, it used to be Americana Hotel. Right. It was designed by 10 architects and it, it was a renovation. I was uh, respons responsible for the interior de design and I had the opportunity to work with uh, a great team with uh, very talented uh, professionals from different disciplines. So I worked with uh, a furniture designer from Mexico, other professionals from Panama, Colombia, uh, and also Americans. And so it was great to, to share different visions and, and 
a, a, a diverse team is and it's something that you only get here <laughs> this kind of experiences you only get here in new york i mean in brazil uh, my, my city is my hometown is uh, not big so i mostly do residential projects and and small commercial projects and here to have my first project in New York, uh, a hotel is is very. I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Yeah. Now, Clarice, this is a, also a really good message for um, the mm -hmm. students out there, which is that you were trained as an architect, but your success and also something that you love, but not necessarily what you thought about in the beginning, is that you're getting a lot of work as an interior designer or interior architecture maybe too, because you do create mm -hmm. architecture in those spaces. But that's a, that seems to be an advantage for you, right? Yeah, actually, I, I my master's uh, is in interior design. Uh, I, I studied in, in Milan and I, I always liked this scale uh, of detail and but uh, maybe in Brazil we are more focused fo focused in uh, functionality and efficiency of, of the space and and uh, maybe because we have a modernist tradition that is very strong. But when uh, here in the U.S., I I I see I notice that when you uh, design a project, you are interested in telling a story and um, so it's very important to um, be focused on the curation of the furniture art and everything works together and you create a cohesive narrative so I, I learned a lot in this sense and now I'm, I'm also applying this um, this knowledge <laughs> in my projects in Brazil and it's very important to uh, Create a cohesive story. How, how uh, often are you an how, emotional design? Sorry? sorry, how often are you? Do you try to go back and forth? Like, what's your schedule like? I I tried to go to Brazil once in any a, a year, but now with the pandemic, um, I don't have plans to going back uh, anytime soon. But it, it, it doesn't, uh, it's not a problem for me actually when the pandemic started, n nothing changed for me very much because I was already working remotely. And, but now I see a lot of other architects, um, they, they are starting to see that it's possible to work remotely. And, and I, I like to say I've been in quarantine for nine years. <laughs> Right, and you're like, you're like, oh, I know this. This is no, this is no problem. I know this. Yeah. Well, yeah. Clarice, do you have, um, do you have, um, a, like a kind of a final thought that you, and we'll bring you back at the end. But a final thought, we're gonna move on to Marisol, just about, um, you know, a student coming out, you know, of school, graduating right now, and really how having having your history. Has that that has been actually a positive in your life? I would say uh, not to be afraid of uh, using your life experience and your heritage to find your own voice, your unique voice as a designer. And, and also, I think it's don't be afraid to ask for help in your community. I mean, uh, I, I, and also, of course, don't forget to help other uh, people there need to be need your help right and I, I think it's it's the uh, what happens in my what happened in my experience and I and that's my yeah. message <laughs> yeah no somebody was asking but um another Carla was asking but it's true like they're saying like tra tra um, transitioning into a new culture for the first time or moving to a new country I, I love what you said. You have to ask for help. You have to find friends. In your case, you found there were other Brazilians that were reaching their hand out to you and yeah. helping and supporting you. But that but that group was also um, very diverse. So it wasn't like you were only staying with your own, you know, what was familiar. It was able you were able to branch out and and learn from others as well. Yeah, 
uh, I mean, actually, I wasn't expect I wasn't expecting anything from from. I mean, I was just trying to work with my clients in Brazil, but then you have to trust that uh, things are will start to happen if you connect with uh, other people and you don't have to be like super anxious that uh, you're not enough or yeah. that um, you have to be like the others. And no, you actually have to, I think you have to embrace um, how you are different from the others and find people um, that have things in common with you. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. Okay, Clarice, um, many thanks, muchas gracias. And <laughs> you. Uh, what is that in Portuguese? What is that in Portuguese? Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado. And, um, <laughs> um, and we'll, see you in a, we'll see you in a little while. All and right. then, um, hola Marisol, how are you? Hola. So Marisol Centeno, um, founder of Marisol Centeno Studio, in um, you're Mexican. Where are you in Mexico City? Where are you, Marisol? Yeah, I'm in Mexico City right, right now. <laughs> right, and and Marisol has also a unique voice and somebody who's developing product and and also the artisanal approach and the things that everything that you learned by you know living in your in your town. Tell us how that how that developed. Uh, well, first of all, uh, hello everybody. Oh, thank you very much for the invitation. I am happy to be here. And well, it's about how would I made a studio and be living here. When you invite me to this conversation, I was reflecting about, you know, at that moment in which I was a student, I was looking for my voice and personal statement as a designer. And for sure, growing up in a multicultural country, like Mexico will buy Afro-Mexicanos, Mestizos, and several indigenous cultures influence my idea about collaboration and diversity relevance in, in my work as a designer, um, Cindy. Yeah, and, and, and you, you, know, we, you know, we talked last week and I was just so impressed by you and also um, just that you have, you're courageous and you have a strength and I think it's, I think the students should um, know that having, you know, you know, you may not always believe in yourself, but, but start, just, just kind of start. So tell everybody how you, how you took that step that took to another step. Well, um, rather, uh, after I finished my studies on textile design, I, I found a job at one of the biggest textiles factory in Mexico designing apparel um, yeah, for low income families. And yeah. soon I discovered that during that time in Mexican textile industry, there was no time, how can I say it, for design and innovation and spending hours designing low quality, mainless products. I don't know, it was very complicated because everything I dislike about the textile industry really was like, just there, but it was an amazing also opportunity because after I resigned this job, I start to question the role uh, of design in, in Mexico culture, just as that. And I make me several questions as, how can I use design as a tool or what would it take to create methodologies for better like human practices or how can design find a better dialogue with the industry and crafts in my country and I don't know, I was extremely curious to understand the qualities and difficulties of handmade products in Mexico and their stories behind. So this is how my studio um, did you start as a specialized brown in designing textiles. What was the first, what was the first, it was, was it a, car, was it a carpet was the first thing that you designed or like what, what was the first actualization? Well, actually, uh, as a bidou, I always start designing rocks. Right. And I choose rocks because actually it's like a, I don't know, random story, but when I was 15 years old, I made an amazing travel to Turkey with my sister. And I had the opportunity of discover these amazing artisans in the middle of the desert weaving beautiful rocks. And it was, 
like a masterpiece for me because what involves to create a rock is like complete and unique textile design process. And since that moment, I fell in love with this yeah. idea of creating homes just with textiles. And did you, and through your older connections with that big textile manufacturer, did you find your way to the artisans that helped you um, start your business? Yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean, I, I always been like very romantic, to be honest. And, and, you know, I strongly believe that design and innovations are like tools through which we can create beauty, but also positive impact uh, on the lives of our collaborators and, I don't know, suppliers, clients. And I think that it's quite interesting now how the conversation, it, it could open to also to the industry and believe in these new worlds or to PMs. Of, I don't know if it's naive, but I think it's possible to mix the best from the, own, this, the industry and the best from craft. I mean, why not? No? So Bidu at the end is formed by a creative and I mean, and like interdisciplinary and multicultural team. And in these um, connections, for sure, industry that collaborate this time with us are very important to create, for example, new threads or implement uh, stuff related to dye process to, to implement in the craft of Zapata community in which I work during, I've been working there during the last almost 10 years now. Wow. Yeah, so how, so how many uh, crafts then um, are working um, in your company? Well, it's interesting because now at this time, um, I mean, we collaborate with Zapotec Productions managers. So people from Teotitlan del Valle, now they're not only involved in the artists, um, in the textiles process, they are also production managers. But uh, I mean, thinking about weavers and dyers and right. women are also involved, we collaborate with around 25 artisans, and, but we have like a, um, two principal leaders family that, I mean, they're like, yeah, my, my right hands, no? For yeah. sure. And Look at the studio uh, students, look at the studio and the people and the process, so, it's so beautiful. Right, and I bet it's also exciting um, that when you're designing something, when there's something that has a heritage, but it's more traditional, and now you're turning it on its head, right? That's the thing that's so satisfying. Yeah, and I mean, I, I really enjoyed this idea of to collaborate with a horizontally team in which it there involves also, I don't know, like Luisa and Mexicans, um, designers from Mexico City and now we are also collaborating with Indian artisans and something that I really enjoyed is how this um, multicultural way of communicate and work together is related by design. I mean something that always takes us together is the possibility to create by using textiles and that diversity I, I try to reflect it in, in my products and in the way we work to create new ways of collaborate by using design. Right, so you, so there, we were just showing the, all of the rugs, but then you are collaborating with uh, many folks in, in completely different ways. I do want to share some of this, but you can take us through some of this. I, I couldn't hear you, Will, could you repeat and, it? Yeah, yeah, no, just that it, it's, it's it's become bigger than just rugs. And now you're collaborating on many different types of projects. And I love seeing the weaving in these. Um, this wall, is this a wall hanging? I love it, like I want it, it's fantastic. Thank you. Yes, I mean, this collaboration, it was very joyful. It was a collaboration for Cartier flagship store in Mexico. And, and Cartier Commission is like a special textile intervention. And, I do, it was a challenge because Cartier was looking for a local approach and experience for their new uh, flagship stores. But of course, we have this challenge of fusion the Cartier um, values. Mm -hmm. So it was a very interesting point to, to also yeah. see how the Mexican design is developing and how um, like 
handmade process could be transforming and collaborating in many different ways. So, yeah, we I enjoyed very much that project. <laughs> I'm, gl I'm glad you said that because you wouldn't think Cartier, you wouldn't connect, you wouldn't necessarily <laughs> connect the two. And I love that you said that. You know, understanding a brand is, you know, when you want to collaborate, you have to understand the brand and find and find a new way and sort of probably pushed you to find a new way. Yeah, exactly. And I don't know, it was a matey. I mean, people know that I am very related to my culture and locality, but I think that that's, I mean, it's how, it's very interesting how in these times we can be local, but also global at the same time and take the best of local and best the global and look for, um, yeah, like a balance around about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm moving into another project. So why don't you take us to this one? It's also gorgeous. Is this a rug or a wall hanging? What is this one? Wall hanging. I yeah. love wall hanging. <laughs> it's not <a> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, this project in particular, it was a very experimental one because there were like a just one edition pieces. And I mean, they were made for a corporative space, but some of the principal um, objects of this, it was to create an experience of design and collaboration uh, with uh, in a women community of um, community an indigenous community in Chiapas, Mexico. So we were exploring uh, how things change by scale and color by using embroidery and we create like different narratives in an abstract and, and mother language. But it was a very joyful and playful way to collaborate with them. So somebody, there's a student asking, but I know the answer. The student is asking where you're sourcing the products, but you're making them all. Um, is it hard to source the materials for the product? Yeah, actually, some of the challenge that textile designers confront in Mexico, I don't know if even other Latin American countries have, but Mexico, I mean, uh, we don't produce high quality fibers. So sometimes it's a very challenging work to to have all kinds of fibers. So that's why I collaborate with the industry help us a lot to find and develop what we need. But yeah, mostly, for example, that hand walking was made in our textile design studio with, with my design team. So I'm, you know, something very fun is that during the last years, many um, textiles um, students from different country uh, uh, yeah, like join our internship. So there was a moment in which Chilean and Indian, a friend's girl was working together. And so multicultural idea. What is this one? Well, this is a very particular collaboration that we made with a contemporary artist, um, Antonio Macotela and contemporary art gallery Labor. And this is like my first contemporary piece uh, collaboration. It was very challenging because it was a jacquard uh, piece. And it was huge. Yeah, it looks <laughs> enormous. This is part of it, right? Yeah, we have to assemble several long pieces of jacquard. And you know, uh, the engineers that open us uh, the possibility of collaborating these uh, in with these industry uh, um, places. It was challenging because we were like playing and it took a time to develop it. It was challenging to be honest. Yeah, but you're so, so interesting like scale, be, you know, materials is an issue and then scale is an issue because you're hand making all of these things, correct? Yeah, mostly. And, you know, every time I start a project, I, I really feel a special connection of how textiles um, join architecture and space and how textile could transform it. So every time I start a project, even sometimes when I talk with my husband, he reminds me, don't complicate it, please. Don't make huge things, Marisol. Right. <laughs> and I always, I don't know, I think it's, part of my statement or way of see things. Yeah, I, you, it does seem very architectural. You de definitely have an architect's eye, um, but, but it's interesting you keep saying we're playing and a lot of the work is really, really joyful. Um, I wanna make sure we get, I, I wanna make sure they see 
and I and I want to get to the Cooper Hewitt too. So let's see, what's what is this one? Uh, that piece is uh, when I won a special uh, cultural government grant from Mexico, and this project called Paraspacios. And the idea of take these textiles was to how uh, the pure of textile could dialogue with the light and mm -hmm. light. And so we were experimenting how the light uh, talks with these textiles and. It was more about that. It was more like an edit editorial and um, experimental project in which we figure out many interesting stuffs uh, also around the beauty of the textile. So yeah, it was one year of experiment with plants and light and white. How can white could be transformed by light? Beautiful. Mar Marisol, somebody is asking, and Andrea is asking, or Andrea Cis Cisneros, Hi, hola. Just how is your community approach to these artisans? I wonder, does the community kind of know about you two right now? Ah, uh, yes. I mean, um, you know, it's it's interesting because our point of view with the relations that we create with the, our artisans in this, it's long terms. And beside this area of product development, I think that B2 is created by two areas, like a strategy design, which is focused in development, uh, new solutions uh, and new ideas to collaborate with this diversity. And for example, in this area, just for give you an example, last year with the Tecnológico Monterrey, which is a very important university in Mexico, we developed like a special uh, machine to wash and improve the carbon of our production. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when I talk about artisans, our point of view is to create a long-term relationship. And every time when people ask me how, how do I relate it with them? I mean, they're like a super professional artisan. So it's like if I was working with an engineer and yeah. all the process costs and the way we work, it's an open information for our team. So as a, as a social design brand, uh, brand, these kind of process are open and yeah, and as I talk you, I told you before, now several artisans with with I have been collaborating during these last years, they are improving and learning more stuff, and now they are managers or like you know managers from some departments of BDU. That that's that's amazing, and and we thank you for that for encouraging that. Look, Marisol is celebrating her culture, you know, one hundred percent, and then and then spinning it on its head, which is what I know all you um, students want to do and she is one person who's making a difference so like think think about that uh i you have just a couple there's a couple of special editions i did want to get to them before we get to um tire ken so tell us about let's so you're collaborating you, you're designing things that no one's ever done before using new materials and then you're doing collaborations and then special editions oh my god marisol <laughs> <laughs> well this piece is, is um it was a commission from Cristina de Leon, uh, a Latin curator uh, from the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum. And I mean, you know, as a designer, I never imagined that moment that the Cooper Hewitt was going to buy a piece for their collection. And I mean, for example, now that you're asking me about the team, this was a very collabor collaborating piece because I was in charge of, of the investigation and developed concept, but also, uh, with Luisa, a textile designer from the brand, and Lorenzo Bautista, Leti, my artisan's team, we worked together and developed this piece because we were weaving with silk and baby alpaca and with a several like high quality process. And, you know, it was a challenge because also the textile committee of the museum was yeah, yeah. very... <laughs> Tricky. Yeah, very, yeah, very tricky and heavy. So, I mean, yeah, we we enjoyed very much this piece. Is, this piece is still at the Cooper Hewitt in the Nature Exhibition. So, that's, I don't know. That's you beautiful. Can it over there. Yeah, congratulations for that. Yes, go to the Cooper Hewitt when you can. It's in New York, if you didn't know, and make, check out that that piece from Marisol. There's one last. Tell us about this project, the the circular rug. Well, this is the Pitaya rug. 
and it's a collaboration for uh, Hotel Esencia, which is a very beautiful ho hotel at Tulum in the Riviera Maya. And I don't know, they have this approach of modernism and story of Mexican modernism. And we were looking for a concept that embrace like, you know, these tropical and amazing um, flavors that we have in, in Mexico. So we were playing about the idea of fruits, of tropical fruits, and this experience of color. You know, if, if you take a look of our work, colorful, it's, it's very important to bring experience to the places. So these rockets on sale only for Hotel Esencia, and they also sell them. But I mean, we really enjoy to collaborate with architects and interior designers to bring to their space experience and textures and colorful joy with our products. <laughs> well, you certainly bring a lot of joy to us. And I also want to thank you so much for really being proud and celebrating your culture. Um, it's really special. Okay, you're going to come back, okay? Um, thank have, you. Yeah, thank you so much, Marisol. And um, if we could get um, Tayer Ken, so if we could get Greg Malitonov and Inez Guzman, I hope Inez got her Wi-Fi going, if they're around. Um, well, there's, hi, Greg. Hi, how are you? Oh my God, Inez, you're, it's, it's working, all right. So uh, um, I just wanted to um, tell everybody that um, partnerships are really special when you find a good one. And I would love for you to tell us uh, how you guys uh, got together, because it's a it's a good story. You want to start, Greg? Sure. <laughs> uh, so um, thank you, uh, first of all, for having us. And we really enjoyed uh, listening to some of the other uh, presenters. Um, Ines and I, uh, I'm uh, from New York City originally, and Ines is uh, born in Guatemala and raised in Costa Rica. And we both met um, at the office of Renzo Piano in Genoa, Italy, working on a big um, museum project for the new Whitney Museum in downtown uh, New York City. Uh, so uh, we both um, met in, uh, in his workshop and, and lived and worked in, in Italy for three years on that project before we um, kind of opened our own office. Okay, can we just say what a big deal that is, right? Working for Renzo Piano, there will be, there could be students out there that end up because, you know, globally and have the fortune to um, work for one of the greats. So congratulations on that. And then, and then that's how you met, which is, which is amazing. Were you pals then? Uh, we, we met there and we, we were, commuting every day. Um, we lived in Genoa City, but the office, Renzo's office is a little outside. So we were commuting one hour every day. So that was the time where we started doing other things aside from Renzo's office, because three years on the same project can be something. Know, <laughs> can be something. And uh, well, that, that's also part of our beginnings, the, the, that commuting time. Yes, and, and that's also something good for folks to know. So if you're working for a big architect, you might be working on a project for three years. And I always have so much um, empathy for you guys because, you know, making a magazine, we do it every month and we see amazing projects, but it takes a long time. So, um, so Greg, so tell us what happened. So you're doing all this commuting. What's, what's happening on this? So you got this side gig going on. <laughs> well, I think we... Um... We started looking around us as well because we were also traveling on weekends and um, really fully embracing that like first work opportunity outside of school to not only um, really invest ourselves in the work. I mean, we we really um, felt like we were part of a bigger family um, in the office, but also kind of taking every chance to uh, to go around and see all the amazing architecture and design that Italy offers, uh, so we're really sponging up a lot of a lot of creative um, input, and then that naturally started bubbling to the surface where we were really looking for for an outlet, um, either uh, 
in uh, projects that Ines was doing um, back home or um, by kind of uh, doing our own little uh, installations just with um, uh, collaborating together with some of the other young people from the office. And Ines, how, so were you, was that Guatemala at the time? Was your home was Guatemala, right? Uh, my home at the time was Costa Rica, oh, but Rica. projects were popping out in Guatemala because fortunately I have then connections in both. Uh, so. And so what were they asking, what were they asking you to do? Um, more retail related things and interiors. Uh, so that was also very exciting for me because um, with Renzo it's very much architecture. Right. And, and then this was a completely different scale of things, furniture, door handles. Um, so that, that's how it started. And, and would you say, because you, you um, like it, it says that there's like a playful approach, but you learn serious architecture. And, and that is probably a very good DNA for you then to be able to do things that are a little bit more open and relaxed. So was that good experience for you to be with Renzo, Greg? Oh, I mean, absolutely. I think it's uh, very, we were very fortunate and also um, very fortunate to see um, a lot of young people go out into the workforce and they don't, um, sometimes their project stops or, um, you know, they're just put on competitions that the office doesn't win or, or something to this extent. And we just got very lucky that the project we worked on was, was quite prominent and also actually ended up going through and, and um, as a result, uh, it was also fast tracked, which meant we got to see all of the stages in a very abbreviated calendar. It's almost like someone hit fast forward on the, uh, on the project uh, button. And so we got to really just quickly see how a project goes from concept to construction um, in an, kind of an abbreviated time. And so after that, there really was nothing else left for us to do except to go out on our own. Um, maybe and, a little bit naively, but no, but no, at the time. no, I love that. So tell the students about that. So Greg, you're from New York, Inez, um, is from, are you from Guatemala or Costa? You're from Guatemala, right? So was that, I mean, what did that mean to you guys? Did it, it ended up being a huge benefit, right? Yeah, we, we always talk about this because um, for some reason, um, like working in New York is really hard. Uh, yeah. And they were mentioning that before, but in, in, in our countries, Things are, many things were starting at the time and design was also a, like a, a new thing. And that opened up for a lot of opportunities. And this fun part of it is also because there's less of a process of a formal process of construction, less legal, less paperwork, so to say. And it allows for the project to be more playful because you're more, you're resolving more on site and with the client like experimenting and at the beginning was, oh my God, what's this? I had the Renzo mentality and then right, I went right. square. <laughs> but I, we needed to, to, to get out of it. Otherwise it, it wouldn't happen, the project. And it was a, a great lesson for me. Right, great, great, great learning. And then also, like you said, trying to really develop your own voice and your own aesthetic, which you, you guys definitely do. I do this project. Tell us where this project is because it's it's really, really great. So we, I, I'd like you to walk through it. Um, this is the mall in Guatemala City. And um, this is an interesting one because obviously this was designed, like the entire mall, to be coherent and the stores should respect all the facades and the signs should all be the same. But a client was like, no, we're in the, at the end of the mall and we're only renting this space if you allow us to do something different. And we were like, well, we just need to pop out of what's existing. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little controversial with the architect of the, of the mall, but, but then um, but they allowed us to do it. Um, and uh, yeah, the idea of this project is to to the place is very cold, so we needed to make the space more cozy, more small, but also to attract people's attention. So how do we sort of like 
pop out of this space visually, but also the space inside should be smaller than the scale of the. Of you the you literally popped out, right? <laughs> you literally popped out, and um, I and it's fantastic. It's fantastic that first of all that you found a client who said do it. That it was probably like you said in the right spot, so that you kind of got the okay, even though they were like, what are they doing? But this is such a fantastic project. Thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, go to the next one. That's colorful. <laughs> yeah, that, that's colorful, <laughs> Greg. So, so tell us about this one. Is this one also in Costa Rica? This this one is in, in uh, Costa Rica and kind of an upscale um, area of Escazú. It's an upscale suburb. And this one's really interesting because it's a uh, it's uh, and it's odd that I'm the one talking about it, but it's a it's a it's a all um, female um, clothing boutique brand uh, that uh, really tries to highlight um, uh, women in design. Women, uh, so uh, Ines uh, was really. Uh, Big part of a team which also involved uh, local women artists, local um, women clothing designers, and every uh, this was an, an an existing building as well. But we kind of used um, color and added volumes to the exterior to kind of create this sense of like stacked, playful, colorful boxes. And then each floor has um, kind of a different palette. Uh, because uh, the ground floor is more um, accessories and the middle floor is more casual and then the upper level is more formal. So everywhere there's um, a kind of a riff on on different palettes with um, with different special moments. Yeah, it's fantastic. And um, is this, so you're working on these projects. These are kind of big projects, right? And do you say, because you're, you're by coast. I mean, you're you're still in New York, Greg. And Ines is there. And are you? What's that conversation about? Just in terms of, wow, this is developing into a brand. That'd be nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's interesting because we work. Um, I think when you have a partnership, it's important to try to both find room for everyone to breathe and to to have their own voice within the partnership but also to kind of, um, you know, maintain a, like you said, a, a kind of an identity um, because if everyone kind of goes in their directions, then you, then you sort of, um, you, you wind up with two separate portfolios essentially or, or work that doesn't talk to each other. And, and I think we, we both have kind of like a, uh, a red flag goes up when it's like, Oh, this is, you know, this would be better if you were more involved. <laughs> and um, and I think we're always, uh, we have kind of a constant flow of communication. Even if one of us is running the project, we have kind of a constant flow of communication um, so that someone is always keeping an eye on how the thing is progressing. Uh, and, and it also allows for somebody to be almost a little bit neutral so they can weigh in at critical moments. You know, you have that, um, trusted circle uh to to go to so that when you when you don't know what's best you know who does and i think that's a very hard yeah. thing for designers who work solo um because sometimes they only have themselves to look to uh and that can i've, I've also been in that position where it's just like i just don't know and you kind of have a a way of um freezing up or 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 spiraling so <laughs> Right. Um, and, yeah. what, and and Greg, what is it like for you, um, you know, American born and um, and maybe especially now, like that you're working in. It's kind of cool, right? You're working in Ines's culture, but yeah. that, you, that you're finding this collective voice together in, in a time where where we want to celebrate um, each other. Absolutely. Yeah, it's been really um it's been really eye opening for me. So um sort of to pick up where the story left off. When we when we started working, I had never been to Latin America whatsoever. And so my first visit to Guatemala was also seeing um, you know, our first construction site. 
And, um, and that was really, um, it's been, it's been an extremely enriching experience and, and one that's really broadened, um, my horizon, but also it's been very interesting to bring the work kind of back, um, to, um, to the U S to, a toward, towards a kind of more familiar context and just see a lot of resistance also about the way people, once they, they, they love the work, but once they see it's that it's mostly done in Latin America, they kind of throw up their guard because it's, um, it's a little bit, um, they have presumptions about the quality of the work or what one can expect from work that comes from a Latin, um, culture. And I find that, um, that's, that's been really, um, really surprising, but also at the same time, um, it has allowed us to be kind of, um, a bit of a differentiator when working in New York, um, things tend to veer towards minimalism and, and kind of a stripped down palette. And, um, and so the, the kind of bright, happy, refreshing attitude that I think, uh, your audience has probably seen a lot of, uh, today, um, it feels very, it feels very refreshing. I mean, that's, that's, uh, you know, as we've kind of been part of young architecture, um, community, um, we're always being told people, oh, your, your point of view is so refreshing. It's so, it's like a breath of the fresh air. And, and it's, um, and for us, it just feels natural, um, yeah. because we have this kind of blended, um, uh, origin. It's so it's so it's so beautiful to see that partnership, Ines. Um, first of all, I want you to tell us about this project, which, by the way, matches my ring, and I'm wearing the ring because I bought it at the SCAD store, and it was yeah. this fantastic artist who doesn't do these rings anymore. So, students out there, if you know the gal, let let me know. I need more, but um, it matches this incredible story. So, tell us about talk about joyful. Like, look at this, and architectural, and architectural. We were talking about your ring in the chat before we came into the talk. Yeah, <laughs> sad, sad. You've been totally distracted by it. <laughs> I had to because I'm like, if anybody knows who the artist is, she apparently she's not doing the rings anymore, but she's got to change that. Anyway, tell us about this beautiful project. So this was actually our first project in Guatemala. So that's how, that's actually where we started, this one here. and. It, it's a very simple commission. They told us, well, we need a pergola, which is an outside space with the roof, with natural light. But then there's needs like, okay, you have a, a translucent plastic roof and you need to cover it from shade and the noise. And how do we make it special? And of course, there's all this um, amazing artisans doing amazing things in Guatemala. And we wanted to go to the root of it. So, uh, this is the, the way they dye thread that will become a textile. Uh, so if you go to certain parts of the country uh, where they do this, you see all the roof terraces just like this. I mean, we just brought it like this, except that we chose a palette and an order. But basically, it's a, it's a housing factory. Like you go to the houses of these artisans and, and go to the terraces and you see this. And, it's, it's been fantastic. This is a project from 2014, I think. And it's still the same. Wow, it's amazing. Okay, I, I want, we're, everyone's gonna come back on in one second, but I do want to uh, give you a couple minutes to talk about this other piece of your work, which is really giving back to the community. This is like just an amazing way to end and then bring everybody back. But apparently, so you do a project every year that's a, like kind of a nonprofit, right? And just tell us about that. Or, or Greg. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so every year we invite um, uh, 10 to 12 students down to Central America to do a uh, public space intervention from concept to construction in three months. Um, this the It's completely run by the participants. Um, Ines and I just act kind of as um, leveraging our uh, network and our uh, experience to make it happen. Um, because we do feel there's a bit of um, a disconnect between uh, the kind of energy and enthusiasm students have for their own design work when they're in school. And then they kind of hit a roadblock um, if the right 
work opportunity doesn't present itself where they're really allowed to kind of express themselves. Uh, so we wanted to put them in the driver's seat and um, kind of harness all that design intelligence that that's kind of cooking for all those years at all these great schools um, and also use it as an opportunity to blend uh, because maybe um, you know your your school is is almost regional or or whatnot, but we kind of bring people um, regardless of age and level and location. So we have designers from uh, China, India, Italy, Spain, Mexico, all coming to to one location and working together and kind of pooling their their knowledge to execute um, a community engagement project for the public good. Um, and that's all done with um, crowdsourced funds and donated materials. Uh, so it kind of has a different approach to the business model of architecture and design as well. Um, so we've done this every year and, and now we've sort of, uh, because of COVID, we've expanded the program. So now we're running um, sort of different parallel teams, which is, which is really exciting to take it um, sort of to the next level. This is so inspiring. By the way, those stripes were uh, unbelievable. You definitely had an Abbey Road moment there, didn't you? Uh, yeah. But uh, is, this the, is this the last project that you've worked? I don't know if it's in the right order. Uh, yeah, so the one you have on the screen was the last one, and that was actually done, uh, the one with the poles was actually done by a, uh, a SCAD student uh, as part of the team, uh, Cheryl came uh, and by the end of it, she was, uh, you know, using a metal grinder to cut rebar. And sorry, I think it's like a steam pipe, but gonna explode behind me. Amazing. By the way, I was looking at, so if we look at the logo of SCAD, this this makes a lot of sense to me because there's it's like the colors there. <laughs> well, what a, what, what a beautiful, uh, meaningful um, way to end. And I'd love to bring everyone back on for a second, if we could, can we, or? And Bernardo, can you come back on? I want to end on this beautiful, like, Abbey Road. It's so cool. Isn't that amazing, you guys? <laughs> and you all seem to me somehow connected, like a beautiful woven tapestry for sure. Yeah, it's very refreshing to see so many colors. <laughs> I love yeah. I love their work and I love Marisol work too. Um, I know, I know, it's amazing. And like, <laughs> and like this, to me, this to me is like the representation of what I say that we look for at the magazine. You know, when SCAD asked us to, if, if there was, um, you know, Latinx talent, we came back the next day, we had a, like a huge list because we just look for amazing work and amazing design and it happened to be Latin, that's great. but. You really want to honor all the colors of the rainbow, which are sit sitting right here in front of us in this beautiful, beautiful nonprofit. What is it called, um, guys? What is it called that the project that you do every year? The right. fundamental design build. Oh, fundamental design build. Okay. Wow. All right. So, is Bernardo? Are you coming back to close this out? If not, I can close this out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, first, first of all, I want to I want to thank you. I want to thank the students. Listen, being in a pandemic is no fun for anyone, but not being together is definitely a hardship. But that is where greatness comes from. Challenges is where you find you find the will, and hopefully, uh, you see this amazing talent and it inspires you. I don't know. I want to be on one of these projects, you guys. Don't you? <laughs> So listen, a, a big, big thank you to SCAD and Paula, I love you more than words can say for what you do for the students. Um, students keep going. We could do another one of these. I'm, I'm all for it. And, and guys, I hope you guys find um, new friends that uh, we shared today. You all are amazing and uh, keep in touch with interior design and follow me on the Cindy Graham and follow them all. All the names are there. Follow everybody. Um, does anybody have one more thing they want to say before we're out? No, well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to meet all of you, I'm sure, this time. And yeah, I mean, it's not it's not easy times, but for sure we, we're going to do it. So we need to stay, yeah, with energy and faith and positive ideas, even in difficult times.
Ab absolutely. Oh, there's Bernard. Yeah, I'm, I came back. I came back. <laughs> oh, thank you, everyone. Truly, thanks again to each each of our panelists. It's been fascinating hearing your, your design journeys. So now stay tuned for our final panel of the day featuring SCAD architecture and interior design alum alumni Eduardo Castillo Cortez, Roberto Vega Peralta, and Daniela Yepes. Now we're just going to take a quick break. Um, so we'll see you very soon. But again, thank you, everyone. Muchísimas gracias por estar aquí. Thank you. Thank you. And, yeah, love okay. you, Dad. We love you. Okay. Bye, everyone. Gracias. Yeah.